All right, so again, uh, I'm Alfredo. Uh, if it's, since it's too long, you can just call me Alf, it's fine. Also, uh, feel free to uh, follow me on Twitter and post you know, picture from the talk, or if, you've, you know, if you found something that is uh, useful for you, you know, share your opinion, it, makes, it means something to me. All right, so today we are gonna be talking about convolutional neural networks. Ooh, right? <laughs> right. So basically we are gonna be uh, exploiting the stationarity, locality, and compositionality of the uh, input data, which is basically most of the time uh, natural data. So it's data that is uh, captured with you know, some sensors from reality. And therefore, <coughs> given that these are uh, basically the transduction on some natural signal, they will have some properties, which are uh, namely these three guys here, uh, which can be exploited in order to improve the performance of our model, okay? All right, so again, as, as last time, uh, I just made these slides uh, a few hours ago, so there are gonna be some mistakes. If you don't understand what's going on, there are gonna be errors, per perhaps, so just stop me, ask me anything, don't let me go, because again, if I lose you, if I lose you, it's very hard for me to get you back uh, on, okay? Deal? Thank you. All right, so let's get started. Nice picture, picture of a cat. All right, so um, signals can be represented as vectors. For example, uh, if we deal with a uh, one-dimensional uh, one dimensional tensor, like we have seen last time, which is means it means it's a vector, we can, for example, represent a waveform wherever uh, every uh, sample, the height of the sample, maybe represent the uh, air displacement measured by a microphone. So in this case, xt are the, uh, is a waveform, uh, waveform height, the, those simple these, uh, numbers here. Uh, so there is a t here because I, I usually have uh, vectors as column vectors in my mind. So uh, although I wrote them as a row, I, I, they are vect uh, vectorial, I mean these are column vectors. On the other case here, we have a cute cat, and we can also think about that as one-dimensional uh, tensor, so it's a vector, wherever, whereas in every element here, I have all the pixels. So for example, here I have the first row, then I have the second row, and so on. So I can think uh, this kit kitten here is one point in a, I don't know, let's say it has 10 pixels times 10, 10 pixels, uh, white and black, so it's in grayscale. So I can think about this cat as one point in a hundred dimensional space, okay? So all the cute kittens can be, move up the thing, all right. Okay, sweet, thank you. So we can also think about this kitten here, if it's like a 10 pixel times 10 pixels grayscale, is one point in a hundred dimensional space, okay? Uh, another point maybe is another kitten and so on. And in this case here, my x, i, j are pixel values. Uh, most of the time, perhaps, we are representing this guy here with a better representation, which would be a two-dimensional uh, tensor or a matrix, wherever we have like in the y-axis, like uh, so over the, col or over the rows, we have the pixels that are vertically dis uh, distributed here, and the, uh, a row, across the row, we have these pixels over here. Maybe that's a better representation than just having everything in just one long vector. Um, why do I represent this guy as a one long vector? Because yesterday, we have seen that for playing with basic neural networks, I just have vectors and matrices, and then I uh, have this kind of a fine transformation of vectors. So we are going to be seeing later on the notebook, uh, we are going to be playing just with this kind of vectors and matrices in order to move kittens around. Uh, finally, we can also represent uh, John picked up uh, the apple sentence as a sequence of words. And in here, every xt are perhaps one vector, one hot vectors which are basically representing which word out of a dictionary is being used in that specific position. So x1 may correspond to John, x2 may correspond to picked, and for example, John may be the, I don't know, whatever word in the dictionary. Like you open your dictionary, you look for the word John, you count how, uh, what is the position from the beginning, and that's gonna be corresponding to the position of that one in your vector that is long, that is long as many uh, so it has a size of as many uh, words in your dictionary. Okay, does it make sense? It's the one hot encoding from yesterday. Yeah? Does, like, is that how a lot of natural language processing works? Does it just have an insanely long vector with just all the different words? 
Yeah. Cool. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so you start with that one, and then you may collapse into some more condensed version, uh, which is basically a embedding representation on that kind of one hot. But again, you start with the one hot at the beginning. Um, all right. So these are different kind of signals we can uh, represent, like uh, audio. Or we can represent images and text. Everything can be represented in a vectorial format. In this case, just one-dimensional tensor, right? So it's a vector. All right. So. What are the particular properties of using natural data? Because again, this is an audio signal, this is an image, and this is also a natural language. So all of these uh, signals have some specific characteristic. They are natural, they look natural to us. What does it mean? So let's see uh, something better here. So let's pay attention to the first uh, audio signal. Uh, we are going to be seeing that here, for example, in the left-hand side, uh, we have this kind of sinusoidal uh, kind of uh, waveform. But again, later on, also we have the exact same sinusoid uh, happening in two different locations, right? So the same kind of uh, small representation, like small detail, may happen in two different parts of the signal, right? Um, now we can just have a look, uh, we can look at a larger part, and we can think, uh, for example, uh, that this peak here, it's happening again here, and maybe that same waveform uh, is also there. And we don't really care where it is. So, I mean, we observe the same kind of pattern in multiple locations across the, for example, temporal domain, uh, the temporal axis in this chart. So we have to pay attention to this part. Natural signals show some kind of repetition on the same kind of patterns over their dimensionality. All right, so let's go back to our uh, kitten here. So let's focus on a particular detail, right? Like before we observed the sinusoidal part, when we zoom in the waveform, we can just focus here on the nose. So let me zoom up a little bit, so okay. It's like a monster, all right. Um, so what we can notice here, this kind of particular uh, shape in this cir circle here, it may be very similar to whatever happens here. Uh, so it's like a darker region surrounded by lighter, lightened pi pi uh, pixels. So similar things, again, re uh, are recurrent. No? They appear again in different regions of our uh, signal. In this case, we move spatially. So this spa space in this, uh, this two dimension before we had time across the x direction. Um, also, we can notice uh, what is the likelihood, what is the probability uh, that those two pixels here, this one and the other one, are of the same color? Question to you. It's very high, right? So pixels that are close together may have the same color. What about this one? Not that high, right? Because you go further away from that neighborhood, so may, things may change, right? If you start looking around uh, with more distance. What about now? They are completely different, right? We get a black pixel at the beginning, and now we see a white pixel, basically, almost. And of course, the, uh, the further you go away, and the less related pixels are. So in here, we also capture, we can think about two different uh, characteristics. First one is that uh, we have specific features co-happening, uh, co like happening at the same time in different locations. And then we have that things that are close together are fairly similar, that as long as you go away, they look uh, not that similar. So, so basically, uh, here we can think about this one, uh, this stuff is uh, stationarity of the signal. So the signal presents the same kind of patterns over and over again. So stationarity is the first word you want to keep in mind. And the second part here is locality. So signals, natural signals, are local. So there is information uh, defined in a neighborhood of your, uh, your signal. And as you go away, it, the, the information starts changing. Okay? So locality and stationarity here. Uh, moreover, how do we make up this kitten here? With multiple kind of patterns, right? So we have patterns and patterns, and then we have patterns of patterns and patterns of patterns on patterns. So there is also a notion of compositionality, right? So we need to have different kind of, uh, like we have several layers of 
abstraction we can see. So if you go down to the pixel space, you can see edges. But as you go a bit further away, you can see some kind of shapes. And if you go back again, you're going to see the whole cut. So there are three main concepts here we want to keep in mind. Uh, the first one was, help me, stationarity. stationarity, which means we observe the same pattern over and over again. Then we have locality, locality because things are uh, meaningful only in small regions. We don't care about things that are further away. And the third one is compositionality, which means things are made of larger things that are made of larger things. Very well. So let's keep this in mind. And let's see how we can exploit these three specific characteristics of uh, natural signals in order to improve performance of our neural network. OK? Are you excited? Yes. Very well. All right. So recap from yesterday lesson. Fully connected layer, just the classical uh, neural net we have seen yesterday. They are also called uh, multi-layer perceptron. They are also called dense layers. You can call them fully connected. Uh, you can call them as you want. Uh, I use this notation here. So we have an input at the bottom, because I said last time, you're going to be putting the input at the bottom all the time. Uh, because this is, uh, makes sense, because here we have the low level features. As we go higher in the hierarchy, we have uh, higher level features. So we go high in the hierarchy as you proceed up in the network. If you have it upside down, doesn't make sense. You go up by going down. Doesn't work. So we are going to have the input at the bottom. Uh, here we are going to be using a affine transformation with perhaps a matrix W. And then we apply a first nonlinearity F. Uh, after that, we are going to have the hidden representation. We perform another affine transformation, another nonlinearity, and then we get our prediction. Is why my y hat. The hat says, means, oh, this is not the actual uh, target. This is my prediction of the target, whereas y is my target. All right, and these are the formulas, which are just representing uh, this pretty chart over here. Okay, no, no, no new things. It's the same stuff, stuff we have seen yesterday. All right, so the function, the nonlinear function, can be the positive part, the sigmoid, for example, the logistic sigmoid, the hyperbolic tangent, and perhaps the Boltzmann uh, function there. All right, so how does neural network work? Basically, if here I plot uh, x, is like uh, my x here has five elements. So in this case, my input vector has uh, five as a dimension. So it's one dimensional tensor of size five. Uh, then I'm going to have my first uh, hidden layer, so I write h1. Then I may have a second hidden layer, right? So we start making deep neural networks. Whoa, right? Uh, how can we make it deeper? Let's put a third hidden layer. Whoa. All right, that, let, let's finish, right? Let's put an output there. I have my y hat. So, what happened to the low i system? Now it's left to right. Yeah, because I had to, it is, there is no space. So, or from left to right. <laughs> or from bottom to top. Okay. Never from right to left or top to bottom. Okay, so or this way, or you just send it down that way. Do all the uh, hidden layers have to have the same? Uh, no, uh, trans it's just okay. because I do, did copy and paste. Oh. <laughs> uh, all right, good question though. All right, let's go on. So the first uh, X, the the input layer, is also called activation at the layer one. So this is my first layer of my neural network. So the first layer corresponds to the input, and also it can be called activation at layer one. Then the same, uh, the hidden layer, number one, it corresponds to the activation at the second layer. Um, activation third layer, activation to the L, generic layer, and the uh, last layer, of course, you can guess, is going to be the activation at the capital L layer, which is my total number of layers. All right, so we go from A1 to A2 by using the first weight matrix, right? Uh, w2 to go from the 2 and 3, w3, and w4, uh, whatever, wl. So uh, let's pay attention to the first output. So this is my first element of this vector, OK? So how do we compute this guy here? This guy here, it's simply uh, the, uh, the row of the matrix times my vector, so it's a scalar product, plus the first bias is the first scalar. So that guy, again, is the jth row, uh, if I consider the jth element, right? Is he OK? You're kind of perplexed. Yes. No, you're fine. OK, very nice. 
All right, so, and this one, you know, it's, it's, it's the usual definition of scalar product. You just multiply and sum all the components. So, from the input, we have these guys going here, wherever, whereas each of these lines is representing one of these weights over here, right? And then, if we consider the second element, we are going to have all the guys there. And for the other guys, the same, right? So every time we have every neuron here, so these are also called neurons. Each of these are neurons or activations. So each of those are basically the scalar, uh, scalar product between this one and, my, and each singular row in the matrix, right? And then we apply the nonlinearity and so on for everyone. So this guy here sees all the input. This guy here sees all the input. And every, every neuron sees everything that happens in the uh, previous layer. Um, same if we want to go to the second uh, hidden layer, to the third activation, I'm going to have those connections, which are stored in the W2 matrix, uh, and so on. For the third layer, all these connections from the W3. And finally, we have our output layer with all the connections with the WL. Okay, so this is again just recap, but I'm showing you a lot of connections, which took ages to draw. Okay, <laughs> right, pay attention. Since I'm lazy, I'd like to draw less lines. Let's see how we can improve this diagram. All right, next one, locality. Right, so what is locality? Can you remind me, please? Uh, just speak. You don't have to raise hands. I don't know what raising hands means. Just Right, so features, we just care about things that are close together. We don't care about looking further away because, you know, I care about what's here. What's there is like unrelated, basically. Uh, but uh, what happens at the boundaries, let's say, like cats, let's say height boundary or something, like there if you pick a pixel. Right, so you can decide uh, different sizes of how far away you look. So you can look like three pixels away, you can look like five pixels away. Uh, I'm gonna actually talk about this in a second. All right, so let's go from the layer L minus one to the layer L. Uh, here we have every one of these first input goes to the first neuron, so on for the second one and for the third. So overall, we have five times three, we have 15 connections, right? All right, so from L to L plus one, here we have just three connections. As we said before, we don't care too much for this neuron to look what happened very far further away, right? Because we, we have said we don't care about things that are further away. So in this case, we are gonna just have less connection. We drop these two connections here to this guy and this guy over here. The same for this guy and the same for that guy. So overall, overall here we have nine connections, right? Less drawing time for making all those lines. So from 15 to nine, by just dropping connections that are coming from input that are further away. Uh, that one doesn't change. So as we move from left to right, we uh, increase our global view. So what does it mean? It means that this guy over here, so this guy here observes just three guys in the input. As you move to the right hand side, this guy sees basically five inputs, right? If you move one more on the right, you're gonna be seeing much many uh, inputs here. So as we go on the right hand side, we increase our understanding of the overall big picture that we are looking at. Uh, so we define now something that is called receptive field. What is this receptive field? Which is something that uh, your, your friend was mentioning before. Uh, so the blue guy here sees only three neurons from the previous layer. And so my receptive field here is gonna be three. It sees three uh, items. On the other side, uh, also this guy here sees only these three guys over here, right? So my receptive field for this guy is also three. What is gonna be now the receptive field of the output with respect to the input? Can you guess? Can you guess? She's three times three, five. Five. Oh, oh, five, five. This is five. <laughs> Sorry, I copy and paste. Exactly, right? Uh, this is five. So this guy here sees five guys here. So the more you move to the right hand side, and the more you, uh, the receptive field increases with respect to the input. All right. Yeah? Oh, is there someone making noise? No, okay. 
All right, so next one. So that was uh, locality, right? We just care about things that are close together. What is this? Stationarity. Huh. So before we start, uh, okay, we start right now with this kind of uh, less number of connections, right? We just start with the 15. Uh, sorry, three times three, nine connections rather than 15. Uh, and we, so before we actually had those extra two connections, no, for the first guy. Uh, over here, what do we do now? We are gonna be drawing these first guys here in yellow. So they look exactly like the white one. Okay, never mind. Uh, the second rows, arrows, are gonna be orange, perhaps, if you can see the color. And the third one here are gonna be red. So what does it mean? This guy here treats these three guys in the same way as this guy here treats these three guys, as the same way as this third guy here treats this input. So if this is a kernel, is a you know, uh, set of weights, I'm using the same set of weights for every neuron. I don't want to change. I don't, have, I don't want to have uh, nine different weights. I just have three weights, which I'm gonna be reusing across my different neurons, okay? So big difference, we have different weights for every edge. Here we are resharing, we are sharing the weight that's why it's called parameter sharing. We share parameters across different neurons. Um, so, and here I collect these three arrows as my kernels. In this case, it's just a vector of three elements shared across the different neurons. Um, so this allows us to have faster convergence of our training algorithm because we have less parameters, we have less <laughs> Uh, things to tune in order to uh, reach convergence. Yeah? Sorry, can you repeat what those uh, stars are? Yeah, so this one here, so yeah. every every arrow here, every edge, yeah. represents a weight. Oh, okay, so... So these three are three numbers representing my three weights. Oh, okay. And this one is called kernel. Okay. I should actually write it kernel. And this is reused by these three guys. So one kernel is associated to the layer and it's reused at every position. Okay. And if you're familiar with convolutions, this is simply convolution. You have a kernel here and this guy is sliding across. All right, so uh, by having less number of parameters, we can have a faster convergence. We have less things to tune up. Uh, you have less computations. Uh, we have better generalization because when we learn about a specific pattern for this guy here, this guy here actually knows already uh, what this guy learned. So given that you are sharing parameters, once you learn these parameters somewhere else in, a, in the image, in the image or in your input data, you can reuse that, say, that kind of knowledge you extracted from data elsewhere. So you can have better, uh, better <coughs> generalization for unseen patterns. Um, it's not constrained to the input size, huh? What does it mean? So if here I add one more neuron, I have to add new layers, new, new, new edges, right? And here I have to retrain the network because I don't know if I have an extra neuron here, what are gonna be the values for this extra neuron, right? Here, since I'm just reusing these uh, values across the whole input, I simply can add a new input here and I simply use the same uh, values overall, yeah? Uh, a, naive, uh, a naive look though on this would be like that since you have less weights, this thing is gonna be not as performant as the fully connected. Ah. And I say naive because probably you have some answer to that, so. So, yes, I, so you're gonna see something uh, very soon in the, uh, in the demonstration on the notebook. Um, Okay, so you're gonna see something very soon. Um, so if you have the same size, same, same number of parameters, this kind of sharing weight is gonna be super uh, hyper performing, like it's gonna perform much, much better, right? So if you have the same number of parameters, this one can have many more patterns you can learn. Because here basically, those things that are further away, they don't really care. It doesn't, it doesn't really, they don't never, sorry, they never learn something very meaningful because things that are further away can change. Uh, they change, they are not related to the close part. So if you look at something close, you have some uh, uniform statistics that is uh, happening again and again around. If you think about things that are further away, they can be anything, so they are unrelated. So this guy here basically 
they learn to be zero, sort of. They want to be uh, invariant to whatever happens further away. So in the fully connected layer, when you use natural data, basically you're wasting connections because these don't bring any information inside the, uh, the game. So even though you're going to use the same number of, let's say, uh, let's say we use the same number, not the same number of parameters, the same size. So exactly one-to-one -one correspondence. We, we, we drop number of parameters here. You don't see any lack of, uh, in performance, any worse performance, because these extra connections don't bring in much of an improvement, okay? Because they are further away. So it depends, okay, with which kind of signals you are using and how many connections. Here I just show you three. You can choose five, you can choose seven, right? You don't have to limit yourself to three. But locality is the property that makes this. Ha, that's correct. Yeah. So you're going to see very soon what's happened if you are evil and start make messing with the data, okay? You're going to see that very soon. So, faster convergence, better generalization, not constrained to a specific input size. Um, kernel independence, ooh, we have done parallelization, right? We have done that thing yesterday. Some, some, some guy was talking about parallelization. Do like that with your head so I understand you've done that. Good. So given that these, par these parameters are just working uh, independently, you can parallelize drastically this stuff because you don't have you don't need to, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, they're in, in, independent, so they don't rely, they don't need to have, they don't have, how, how do you say? Um, okay, they're independent. <laughs> you know better what I'm trying to say. Uh, last one, uh, again, given that we are using sparsity, uh, one sec, we, given that we are using sparsity over there, we have a reduced amount of computation respect, with respect to the fully connected uh, network. Yeah. So I understand with stationarity, we expect certain patterns to repeat sometimes, but we don't expect it to be like periodic with period equal like three or five pixels. Right? That's so this seems like a much stronger assumption than just like some patterns. Okay, I understand what you're saying. So here, uh, you're trying to look for this pattern here, and maybe you have it, so you get a high activation here. Here and here, you don't see the same pattern. So here you're gonna be have you're gonna have a low activation and a low activation, but you're just looking for this three long pattern. So you don't have you just look for this three long pattern everywhere if you have a long signal. Let's say you have like a <coughs> signal with hundred units, you just have this little kernel going down all the span of the, your signal. And you just get out this higher activation whenever you find a signal. You just find it perhaps just in one location. Yeah. So, um, so when so uh, yeah so. In that context, so when you are training, and it sees the pattern somewhere, right? And, it, and the, because the weights are shared, so by backprop it learns to change the weights. And at some other part of the image, the the it doesn't see that pattern. So wouldn't it like screw the weights up? Uh, the That's up? why you have multiple kernels. So every layer you have multiple kernels, and every kernel tries to specialize on a specific pattern with which it resonates. So when it gets some excitation because, oh, I found my pattern. It gets very excited and then this gets rewarded and it starts growing. If it doesn't see the pattern, the backpropagation, so the gradients, when you perform backpropagation, we didn't talk about backpropagation, but anyhow, when you compute the gradients, you multiply by the input, right, the activation itself. If the activation is zero, low, there is no gradient. So the gradient gets killed, right? So once it reaches a minimum, it stays. Uh -huh. So every time you get something excited, the gradient bam, gets boosted, busted, boosted. How do you say boosted? Yeah, be boosted. Uh, and then the, you get um, that kernel to improve better, right? If that kernel doesn't see anything, it doesn't even uh, get any kind of, uh, uh, it doesn't get to change its own va values. But good point. But with, uh, with, with random weights, you have to it, shout because I'm dead. Uh, with random weights, is it supposed to know what it, it's looking for, that, that uh, uh, kernel? Okay, I have a lesson on that too, but uh, you should come to my class or just look my videos recordings. Anyhow, uh, when you start with random weights, you have a chance of observing a specific kernel, a specific uh, pattern. Anytime you observe that pattern, one of your weights, one sorry, one of your kernel is going to be a bit stronger than the others. So the one that is a bit higher gets improved, and when you go up with one, the other one are getting pushed down. So basically, when you find one of your randomly initialized kernels 
to start resonating with a specific pattern is going to be strengthening its own response to that specific, specific pattern while trying to push everyone else down for that specific uh, uh, pattern. Does it make sense? No? Yes? No? You can say no. I try again. No, but, uh, I can... oh, okay. Other questions? No? Should I keep going? You like it? Yeah, question. So the kernels are competing with each other to isolate one? Yes, each? yes, but I didn't say that. Uh, that's what happens in a, if you check the, how the uh, training mechanism works, which I didn't actually explain. But yes, every kernel is going to be specializing uh, in a specific uh, feature. And whenever it yeah. is specialized, it gets to improve its own uh, performance and with that. Yes, it's going to be everyone is going to, every kernel is going to be focused on uh, focusing on a specific kind of pattern. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. Other questions? No. All right. Shall we go on? No. People are sleeping. Hello. Uh, did, ah, hello. You're back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go on. Uh, more pictures. Okay. So, how do we use? Oh, sorry. What's happened? Okay. Uh, what do, what does it, how do we use this convolutional neural network with, let's say, uh, images? Because that's what, what I play with uh, for most of my PhD. So this is a standard uh, neural network. I'm going to try to explain now some uh, of those components. So uh, the, uh, for the first part, we're going to have multiple layers. So here I have like multiple D blocks, which are my discriminators, for example. I have multiple blocks which are containing some convolutional uh, module layer. So we have multiple layers, deep networks, uh, which are convolutional because we'd like to share parameters and make them sparse so we don't have so many computations. And so these two things are basically summarizing the three uh, um, specific uh, characteristics of natural data, right? We said it is sparse, uh, sorry, it is local, uh, locality, sessionality, which is used by this guy here, and then is uh, compositionality, which is used by multiple layers, right? Uh, and the receptive field concept. So these here are how we exploit those three uh, uh, particular st uh, statistics. Uh, then we have nonlinearity. Why do we have nonlinearity? If you have just linear layers, what is the output of a, a matrix multiplied by a matrix multiplied by a matrix multiplied by a matrix? Just a matrix, right? It's, it's all collapses down. So you need nonlinearities in order to keep those things uh, from collapsing. Um, then we have pooling. Huh, what is this stuff? You're going to see soon what it is. Uh, then, what's, okay, batch normalization. This is actually what you're going to be using every time you're going to be training networks, which is uh, improving speed for uh, the convergence and it also adds some kind of very good noise, which allows your network to generalize better. Uh, I know I said many things. If you didn't understand, it's fine. Just use this stuff. Works very well. Um, last one, residual connection. One more thing uh, is been uh, very popular recently is to skip connections. So here you go from the bottom layer to the second layer to the third layer. But then every time you initialize this stuff at the beginning before training, this stuff is randomly initialized. So Things that come here get you know, distorted, more distorted, more distorted. Here you have just crap. Uh, so given that you perform this extra connection and sum here, whatever is here, the network can decide just to turn off this guy. And therefore, you start with a smaller network. And then maybe if the network uh, needs some more uh, modeling power, then it actually starts using some of this modeling power here. So, But these residual connections are something that are really, really good uh, because it help your network start with little tasks and then it starts growing basically in modeling capacity. Uh, so these two guys is something you're going to be always using in your uh, network. Yes? Um, I have a question. I might have missed it, but what does D1, what are those rectangles? Right? Uh, these are coming from a, a copy and paste, I guess. So those are uh, discriminator blocks, discriminative okay. blocks. Okay. That's why I call them D. Uh, okay. Because I had also a thing coming down which had some kind of gener uh, generator 
or okay. yeah, so something. D discriminator block one through L. Yeah, okay, you can just think about those as layers of your neural your okay. network. Okay, okay. Right. nothing nothing fancy. But each of those uh, contain a convolution, a nonlinearity, maybe a pooling, which I haven't explained yet. All right, so let's see um, what poolings are. Oh, okay, sorry. Actually, let's see how it works. So in here, I provide my image at the bottom. And it's like a three layer, maybe uh, image, because it's like RGB layers and has a spatial uh, dimensionality too. And at the end, I have something that is like more of a vector, which each, each element may be uh, telling me the likelihood of observing a specific category if we are doing classification as we have seen yesterday. So in the yes, in case of yesterday, we had like a vector of size three, whereas each point was ex was expressing how likely it is to have that uh, point belonging to one of the three spirals we have defined. So we start with something that is flat and large, right? So it's like very thin and very large, and we go with something that is one by one, so it's very narrow underneath, but it's very long, right? Uh, so in between, what do we have? In between, we have something uh, in, in between, like in the not that spatial, uh, there is not that much spatial information, but we have much more thickness in this sense here. So the information that is here, uh, the, like if you think like the, not like mathematical information, just uh, information in the English English way of like just easy way um, the the term that you use in English not any kind of uh, specific information so the information uh, contained in this part here is the same information that is here but here the information is expressed as a spatial information and here as you go up the information is actually encoded in the uh, depth of this kind of representation um, so here the spatial information may represent where the position of the ear of the cat is, the, where the nose is, where the eye is. And the depth of the, in the image, it tells you the color, right? It tells you something that is uh, locally defined in that specific point. Yeah? Would you have one per pixel? Here? No. Up there? The, yeah. So this is like one by one pixel? Yeah, so you'd have, for your entire image, would be like one of those per you pixel. Have, yeah. This is just so one for the whole image, and each element here may tell you what is the likelihood of observing like a cat, a dog, a horse, or anything. So here you have descriptive information, which is not any more special, oh, but it's like telling okay. you the likelihood, the probability of having a specific item okay. if we are doing, for example, classification. Whereas here the information is spread uh, in, the spatial, <coughs> in the spatial dimension. So from special to uh, you know, you. descriptive. And in between you get uh, a halfway representation. Uh, and here we go from thin to thick. All right, I'm almost done. Um, so pooling, I said, right? What is pooling? So let's start here by drawing something. Uh, I've just drawn the top corner of my kitten picture. So here I can represent my four pixels in the top left corner. I can get those pixels and compute the p norm. What is the p norm? It's just that thing there. It's the the p, p root of the summation of the each element rise to the power of p. So if you have basically the uh, Euclidean norm, you just have the number two there, right? So you have the square root of the summation of the squares of the items. If you have the one norm, you just have the summation of the absolute values, right? Um, if you have the P, P going to infinity, then you basically have the uh, max, right? So if you have the max norm, uh, P goes to infinity, you have the max. So basically, given those four pixels, we, it can, we can extract the maximum value, or we can extra extract like the norm value, or you can extract whatever thing you want with the uh, P pooling, okay? So most of the time, you're gonna be using max pooling, which is basically this guy here. So we have the first guy there, we perform the LP norm, and we get our output over here. Then we are gonna be moving our basic window across the next four uh, pixels. And again, we are gonna be performing the uh, LP norm, and then we have our next value, okay? And we do this stuff across the whole image. 
So if we perform this operation on the input image, what is going to be the output of this operation? Smaller image. Smaller image, right? Spatially smaller. Sweet. So for example, if I started with an image which is m by n, I end up with m half and n half if I use these kind of parameters. My channels here, C, are going to be the same channels here. We didn't change the depth of the information. We just changed this direction. So something you want to keep in mind, what's happened? This was my uh, activation at specific layer. I apply uh, pooling, and I have how much information did I lose here? Uh, in a fraction? In fraction, what's happening? Oh, okay, so what, how much information did I retain? 25%. One fourth. One fourth, okay, thank you. I don't know percent. All right, <laughs> it's confusing. All right, anyhow, uh, we have retained here one fourth of the information. This is uh, considered a very, very strong bottleneck, which means you're, you're going to be losing information, really, like it's, it's bad. So what is a very good uh, practice is going to be having the, the convolutional layer actually expanding uh, these guys. So if you start with C channels, you're going to be ending up with two C channels, so that when you cut half the X and Y dimension, you just lose, you just go to one half of restriction of information. Does it make sense what I say? No, no, hold on. Just let me check first if I, people understand. So first we said by applying pooling, we shrink, if it's an image, by uh, half and half, so we get a quarter. So if I increase twice the channel size, I'm just losing half, right? Okay, yes, no? So, so channel size, you mean the number of values that I can take, for example, that I, that index I. So the channel here? No, that index I up there, that's the RGB, right? R, R the value of, the amount of R, the amount of G, and the amount of B. No, no, and this it, one here are oh, simply no. uh, one, two, oh, three, okay. four guys. Here. Okay. So this is applied to every channel. So for every channel, I perform this kind of shrink, okay. shrink down. So this is like, it's also, I think it's called smoothing. But did you tell us why are we doing this? Or you're just explaining the procedure? I haven't told you why. Oh, okay. You can ask, why? Yeah. <laughs> why are we doing this? All right, very good. So uh, why are we doing that? Uh, I slept, not too much, so maybe I forgot. All right, so why are we doing that? Because there are um, too much data in the beginning. We have so much spatial data. And we were trying to go from those large uh, representations to something that is narrow, right? Did you just remember the slide of before? Yes. So we were like large, and then we go narrow. So we increase this dimension by uh, using convolutional kernels. By every kernel gives you one point there in that vector. And then by using this one, we can reduce the spatial information. So we go from our spatial image on the bottom to something that doesn't have any more spatial information, but is just a descriptor of the image. So just one question. So if I put one, so in principle, image can have different detalization. Does it mean we're just looking on the same image from different detalizations? Yes, that's correct. So, for example, when you have a, some print in a newspaper, if you will look like this, you will not see anything. But if you will move far, you will see picture. Yeah. So that's what we are doing. That, we just yes. trying to produce different layers on different detalization to see different sides of objects. That's that's correct. So we perform this uh, for different reasons. One of these reasons is to have different kind of zooming factor of our data. So the more you go, you apply these operations, and the more you have a global view, and the more uh, further away you go from your newspaper. Uh, the other also, uh, the other also uh, kind of uh, reason is that we are going to be lowering the amount of uh, data we are dealing with. There's something that confuses. So in that picture, we had a flat image, and then at the end we have classification, right? Yeah. That's we start from the image, we end up with classification. Yeah. This is done through neural net, you know, those layer, whatever conversions we do. Mm. But now, next slide, you're showing us how to do it by hand. So you change this dimension here yeah. from large to smaller by using this pooling operation. You increase the thickness 
by using the convolution. So this whole thing you're describing, pooling, I thought this was just an end product of your whole neural net. Yes, this is my neural network. This is your network. And each of these blocks contain a convolutional layer, a nonlinearity, and the pooling operation. It's like a sandwich. So it becomes, uh, it becomes flat that there is also fully connected layer in the end. And you flatten the output and apply a fully connected layer. Um, but it's square as it goes through the convolution of pooling. So what, what is your question? Sorry, I didn't understand. So, so two things, I guess, if you remove this, <coughs> then everything is going to be the same size. I mean, when you go through layers of a neural network, yeah. do the conversions, the pooling is something additional you're trying to add now, or it's always there? So I, if you don't apply any pooling here, from here to here, you're going to have the same spatial location, we just increase this thickness. So every time I, mult I do a convolution between this one and my kernel, I get the first plane. Then I do uh, this convolution between this one and another kernel, I get the second plane here, and so on. So here I have multiple outputs of multiple kernels. But the, the, large, the, the spatial information is the same. It doesn't change. But if you have less number of hidden units, then doesn't it the hidden units are representing the thickness. So if I have one linear, if I have one linear unit, I'm gonna have just one like this here. So the number of linear units before I was showing you fully connected layers. In this case here, okay, oh, okay. let me go back. It's not the number. So this guy here, yeah. if, if you can think here, despite uh, the fact that th th here there are three and here there are five. You can think about here having also five, and the other guy gets input from, you know, from outside. So whenever you apply convolution, you're gonna have the same number of input and output. So if we go back here, if I apply a convolutional kernel to this guy, one convolutional kernel, I get exactly the same guy here, the same spatial information, I mean, same with the same uh, dimension in the space. If I apply the second convolution, then I have the second layer. So if I apply 10 one, I'm going to have something that is 10, uh, 10, 10 lines long. But then again, I would like to remove this spatial information so that I have like one vector. Yeah? So these different kernels and the things below, that's what you see on the next page? Say again, sorry? So on the next slide, you yeah. have C, which is like you do this more than once. So it's, it's the depth. Yes, yes. And that so the, depth is the, the, the C is the, the, the height here. I should put that notation here. There was another question there. Yeah? And so the, but earlier you are talking about like RGB values. Yeah, so here I have three layers. One, two, three in this guy here. But here we, we have maybe m many more. Okay. So if I have three here, the thickness of this guy here, this might be like 20. You know. Okay. So and this may be the size of my... Uh, you know, number of objects I'm trying to look for. So C starts as three and then raises. Yes, that's correct. If I use color images, yeah. I guess what confused me is that even if you're at the end, you always have one by one. If I would like to perform a classification task, yes. yes. Regardless whether you do pooling or not. If you don't do pooling, you will, you will never end up with one by one. The end decision is always. Yes, but I have to change the size of this stuff, right? So if I, I apply pooling, this becomes half by half. If I apply pooling, it's going to be half by half, and then I'm going to end up with one by one at the end. The final decision is going to be applied on the whole image. Okay. All right, so I think that was it. So this was the final. Yes, I was also in time. So, and that was the final thing, right? The, how you perform the pooling operation. So at the beginning, first layer, we start with uh, three channels, then maybe you apply a convolution, you end up with 10 channels, or let's say we go from three to uh, 12. But then again, I'm gonna cut half and half. So with one way, I try to increase the thickness of these guys, and the other way, I try to remove the spatial information. So here we have seen uh, 
how a convolutional neural network is built and how we are going to be applying different, uh, different kind of layers. And before we have seen a comparison with the fully connected layer, which has many more parameters. So right now we are going to be showing you a quick uh, example about training uh, two networks with the same number of parameters. One is a fully connected network, the other one is a convolutional neural network. So given that they have the same number, number of parameters, but the convolutional neural network is sharing those parameters, you may have many more kernels with respect. I mean, you have much more uh, uh, modeling capabilities. So we are going to see how they compare uh, by using natural images, like let's say pictures of numbers drawn by some individual. Um, and, so, and we are going to see how they perform, the convolutional network and the fully connected layer. Then we're going to see what happens, like uh, your colleague was mentioning before, if one of these uh, hypotheses are not there anymore. So what does it happen if locality, stationarity, or compositionality are going to be going away? And we are going to be see, seeing very soon what is the result. Other questions? Yes, please. I'm just curious, do you, for the residual bypass connection, Yes. Do you use that for the same reason that you, you would like implement dropout, or are they... No, no, this one, right? Yeah. So this one I use for, um, okay, let's think we are going to have um, 100 layers, uh, and there are no bypass connections, okay? Uh, when we initialize those networks, we initialize them usually with some small values towards the zero. When you perform the uh, computation for uh, getting the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to the parameters, you perform like basically the multiplication on the final uh, on the final uh, loss uh, derivative with these weights. No, so if you if you perform some uh, you know when you perform the chain rule with uh, matrices, you basically uh, multiply the gradient by the input. So given that those values are very, very tiny, you have a tiny signal at the end, multiplied by something uh, of which eigenvalues are all small, small, right, towards zero. So you have some signal here that is basically dying through the network. So all these guys down there, they will never be uh, trained. You know what? Where is your input coming from? The bottom. And where do you send your input through? Trash, because it's noisy, init noisily initialized, right? So you have your very nice input, and you just destroy all the statistics, sending it through a random crap. And you know something starts changing here in the uh, upper part, but those things really never change. When you apply this kind of bypass connection, residual connection, or residual, residual bypass or shortcut connection, three way, three names for the same shit. Um, <laughs> sorry. So in this case, you have the gradient coming down, and then oh, it goes down here. So this guy is going to be using the same gradient that this guy is observing in order to optimize its own parameters. So these guys are absolutely essential if you start doing uh, you know, networks that are kind of deep. Otherwise, you have some problem that is called vanishing gradient. Those, those gradients, basically, given that are multiplied by matrices with small eigenvalues, they vanish down. Or even worse, if those weights are Getting, you know, you try, oh, okay, I don't want to lose my, my, my gradient. I increase those weights. Those weights are very nice. They are large, and you have like eigenvalues that are larger than one. And then, boom, you have exploding gradients. So it's very kind of finicky thing. So if you just add those connections, everything just works fine. Also, that's why we use this one, sort of speaking. This is so good. Um, if you are familiar with like fiber optics, Sometimes you have those repeaters in the fiber optics. Are you familiar with fiber optics? Optics? No. Are you familiar with transistors? Yeah. All right. So why are you using a high impedance uh, transistor after another transistor? You don't want the transistor that is on the afterwards to load your first one. Otherwise, you just drag everything down, right? So these guys here are basically some kind of impedance matching. And they are separating every block. So this block doesn't load my previous block. And so we put everywhere, I put everywhere in those batch normalization, which allow my network to be like independently uh, training each separate block without having this kind of um, loading uh, side effect. Okay? So these two things are really, really 
uh, essential. I could have a lesson just on those two, but I just put them there because you have to use them. Uh, I mean, I, rec I highly recommend. Last, last summer school I taught, two weeks ago, uh, there was just one guy who applied, uh, this guy here, and he won the challenge of the summer school. He won like the, the prize, so I was like, yay. Uh, uh, what was the price? I, I, don't know. I think uh, I think it was a book from uh, uh, machine learning stuff. It was very nice. How much was that book? <laughs> <laughs> I just interested in the number. Forty bucks. Forty dollars. All right. So this is what that was it for the uh, introduction to convolutional neural networks. Right now, we are going to see this um, exercise, if everyone is OK and you don't have further questions, where we're going to be uh, playing a little bit with the notebooks and see how they perform. Okay? So uh, let me introduce here my colleague. Please, come in. All right, so um, Alfreda gave a nice uh, overview of the fully connected and convolutional neural nets. And at some point of the exercise, we had um, basically we compared convolutional neural, um, fully connected uh, neural networks, and how every neuron from the previous layer has to be connected to every neuron in the uh, the um, the layer after that. Thank you. Uh, in convolutional neural networks, we uh, basically take advantage of the locality. Um, which is uh, one of the three, uh, basically, properties of images is locality, um, stationarity, and uh, composition, uh, compositionality. Um, to reduce the number of um, edges and connections, and uh, basically we have the uh, receptive field. So I'm just repeating a little bit uh, what he said. And right now, uh, let's uh, basically... Um, look at the specific example and kind of get uh, hand, hands on. Uh, so, yeah, so you can follow that uh, on your laptops or for those who have succeeded with the setup um, of the Jupyter Lab, you can just uh, go in the Jupyter Lab. Um, so I'm gonna uh, go and start the terminal window. Uh, here I have uh, my exercise in the workspace and I did have to do git pull um, to pull the latest changes from yesterday as we added one more notebook. Um, and the notebook we're going to need is the uh, notebook number five. Yeah, so if you did make some changes uh, in the notebooks, which basically I uh, most likely did because uh, as you run the notebook, it saves the outputs and when you try to do git pull, it won't let you. So you can do git reset hard, git reset hard and then git pull. Um, or you can uh, just follow it as a demo. So uh, let me ask first um, how many of you have used any deep learning frameworks in the past, uh, not counting this school? Uh, who who have used deep learning frameworks? Any like Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch? So about the half. How many of you uh, of you used PyTorch? Um, just a few. How many of you used Keras? So yeah, most of the people who used deep learning frameworks used Keras. Um, all right, thanks. Yeah. So. Yeah, for, for this um, exercise, we're going to use uh, PyTorch, but I'm, try I'm going to try to make connections to Keras. Uh, so the first cell, uh, there is nothing uh, special. We just import Torch. Uh, then we import the NN module, which is uh, what we're going to need uh, to basically construct our neural network. Uh, the Optim module is for optimizers. This is where all the uh, optimizers leave, like Atom, RMS Prop, SGD. 
Um, so we're gonna need the data sets, Torch Vision data sets, uh, to import the MNIST, uh, which is what's gonna be used for, uh, for this uh, exercise. Uh, and of course, Matplotlib for plotting and NumPy uh, also. As we're gonna be plotting it, we're gonna be converting it back to NumPy. Um, and functional, and then functional uh, is gonna be used for uh, for some for activation functions. Uh, you will see. All right. Uh, so the first step is simple. Let's just uh, load the data set. And um, this is uh, just a copy from what's recommended in the PyTorch MNIST uh, tutorial. Uh, you can see uh, familiar steps here um, where we load the data, we physically download it uh, to the folder, then we uh, normalize it, we shuffle it, uh, and also we batch it, we um, assemble it in, into batch sized, batch sized tensors. I personally, uh, so for this we, we do the shuffle for the testing step, but that's uh, strictly speaking not mandatory. And let's take a look at a few images here. Uh, those are uh, familiar to, to you, the handwritten uh, uh, digits from MNIST uh, dataset, so nothing um, special here. Uh, those are 28 by 28 uh, images, uh, 28 by 28 pixel images. All right, so and uh, for so the purpose of this exercise is we're gonna um, construct the fully connected and convolutional uh, neural networks. Uh, we're gonna make uh, we want to make sure that they have roughly or like almost exactly the same number of parameters. And we will see how well they do on this MNIST data set. And then we will try to break up some of the assumptions that Alfredo was talking about, uh, in particular, the locality um, uh, by uh, scrambling the pixels, by shuffling the pixels uh, in some random order, and see how well uh, they do after that. Um, so for those, uh, so basically, there is two, uh, strictly speaking, APIs to construct a neural network in PyTorch. One of them is very similar to what we used in Keras. Uh, so in Keras, we have two APIs, sequential and uh, functional. Uh, but both of them, uh, we kind of put the layers one by one as the Lego blocks. Uh, something uh, that I have here. Um, this is uh, basically, I'm defining uh, the whole uh, logic of the neural network as one sequence. Uh, and this is for a uh, fully connected network, which will consist of two linear layers followed by ReLU uh, nonlinearity with the one more layer followed by, followed by the softmax, um, out, softmax output activation, um, which is what we're going to need uh, for handwritten, handwritten digit classification. So it will output, as output the vector of uh, floating point numbers, which we will uh, take the maximum probability and assign the label according to that. Um, so in uh, PyTorch, it's a little bit lower level than Keras. Uh, we typically extend, we, 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 we uh, prepare a class uh, derived from an N module, which is going to be the base class for all the neural networks you write in PyTorch. Um, here you would um, override the constructor, um, and you would uh, basically invoke the base class, con base class constructor via the super uh, method, adding additional uh, methods which are not present in the base class. Uh, in this ca case, it's the input size and the logic of the network. Um, finally, we need to override the forward method, which is the, the logic of our forward pass as we train. We have the forward pass, which in this case is going to be a bunch of affine transformations uh, followed by nonlinearities. And there is also a backward uh, pass, which uh, is the uh, partial derivatives chain rule differentiation, which comes for free to us uh, in PyTorch, but we still have to call backward on the loss, as you will see uh, later in the training loop. Uh, so here, yeah, basically the forward pass is uh, super simple. 
we just take those uh, square images 28 by 28. To be able to feed them to uh, the fully connected network, we have to flatten it. Uh, and the view in PyTorch, as um, Alfredo introduced yesterday, is essentially like a reshape in NumPy, uh, but it doesn't make a copy, so that's why it's called view. Um, and we uh, flatten it to the input size. We have to be sure that the input size is actually what we pass in the, um, as we're going to use this, has to be 28 by 28. All right, and next is the ConvNet. Uh, so here, uh, on purpose, uh, I, I used a slightly different approach. I didn't put it all in one uh, sequential model, but I broke it down, creating a basically a member for each, uh, for each layer. And we will have here two convolutional layers, uh, Conv2D uh, layers, uh, followed by two linear layers. This is actually exactly what um, Alfredo had in this picture uh, on the right. Um, from top to bottom, uh, from sorry, from bottom to top, except uh, <laughs> he was calling the D, uh, which I'm guessing from some generative adversarial <laughs> discriminated generator. Uh, yeah. So and don't pay attention to this like multiply four, multiply four. It's uh, basically the goal here was to tune the number of parameters to match between the fully connected layer and fully connected neural network and the convolutional to prove our point. Okay, uh, in this case, if you define it like that, as opposed to sequential, you have you will, would have more in, interesting looking forward method, which you mandatory, mandatorily has, have to override um, in each neural network which you uh, write. Uh, so it just basically goes from the, from the outermost to the innermost layer. First you go to the convolution, when D, relu, uh, pull in, convolution, pull in, flatten, fully connected, relu, fully connected, softmax. All right, so then we just need to shift enter. Uh, so this thing is, uh, yeah, don't, the, the thing is uh, in PyTorch, similarly to Keras, we actually uh, write in pretty much device agnostic uh, code. And uh, basically, if you have a GPU, it will pick it up. Uh, it might be a difference in dependencies. Keras depends on TensorFlow. So to run on TensorFlow, you have to pip install TensorFlow-GPU and um, make sure that the CUDA drivers are in place. Uh, but if you don't have a GPU, you just run on the CPU and you don't have to make any changes to your code. Similarly, uh, if you divide, define a device string like that, it will switch to the CUDA uh, if you have GPU. If not, if it's not available, it will just run CPU, and you don't have to make any changes. Uh, so this is the uh, again for the yes. So I'm still uh, stuck on the convolution thing. If you just go back a little bit, it says kernel size equal to five. Does that mean five uh, five units in the back is connected to one in that? That's, that's yeah. the meaning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so there are two two layers you put there, conf1 and conf2. The first one it has in channels equal to 1 and the next one it says in channel is set to be same as n features and I'm not sure what that means. Why? Do you see the first the first one the arguments is 1 n, uh, one and n features. The next one is n feature and n feature. I'm trying to understand why the, the difference is. So here uh, basically we're free to uh, kind of adjust the parameters as long as the, they're consistent across layers. And here the main goal was to uh, get a neural network which uh, would have the same number of parameters, trainable parameters as the fully connected layer. Uh, right, so you know uh, you can control uh, the number. Uh, so the parameters you can fix uh, as uh, you define your, your <coughs> convolutional neural net is the kernel size. You can also fix the padding, uh, sorry, you can fix the stride as you uh, move the, uh, the kernel with, uh, it can be one or two uh, or more. Uh, so th there's uh, nothing wrong to have the same number of input channels. But maybe I'm missing the point, Alfred. Do you, do you know? So you're gonna, use, you're gonna use this conf1 and conf2 differently inside your inside neural networks. Yes. Nice. The first one is conf1, then later on you use conf2. Right. After my. <laughs> uh, let me. Does it work? No. It's okay, just be loud. 
No, because it's not going to be. <coughs> it's not going to be recorded otherwise. Okay. So here, unless you very well, we go from basically uh, one channel because we are having a white, black, a black and white image. So we just go from one layer to a any kind of number. So let's say five layers. So we have five different kernels. Those uh, parentheses with the three stars I put there. We have five of them. There are no three stars. There are five stars because we are going to be considering a uh, neighborhood of five pixels. In this case, five pixels times five pixels. So these kernels are 25 values, and I have uh, as many as this guy. How many? How many is that? I don't know. Maybe if this is three, I'm going to have three kernels of 25 elements. Okay. So the second one, we are going to be uh, having. We start from one layer, one one layer thickness input image, and we end up now with uh, we said three three layers, right? So afterwards, we are going to be using convolutional kernels, which are going to be going from three uh, thickness to, again, three. So this means that my kernel, uh, in this case here, was five by five. In this kernel, in this case here, is five by five by three. and three. And how many I have? This many. So this is three. OK, if this is a different number, uh, let's say this is four. So you have uh, five by five times three, because this was the size of this guy. And then I have as many as this guy. So I have four, five by five by three. OK? Does it make sense? No? You can say no. I can try again. No, so no I, I, see, I see what you're saying. So, so the three different colors have been processed separate. Oh, here we there, just have one only, color. There's only one, one color. color. Okay, okay. It's a grayscale image, so there's one input channel. But if there would be three, have. I would just process them all together. So if this would, been, would have been three, this would, be, would have been five by five by three. And then I have this uh, three-dimensional uh, tensor moving around and performing convolution around the image. OK? Yes. Other questions? See this light projector? I can't even see anything. <laughs> yeah, so the, the channels control the depth uh, of the tensor. And the kernel will be in the xy plane. It's, it's really sliding. It's not divisible. All right, so let's uh, go, let's move on and look at the training law. So, you know, in Keras, Keras is a high level uh, deep learning framework, and we usually work uh, with something called estimator. Uh, estimator, it's uh, basically something you define and then you just call dot fit on it if you want to train it or if you have a for instance if you want to pass it uh, on a gener uh, if you want to train it if your data is a generator python generator you can do call dot fit underscore generator and then once you train it saved weights uh, you want to uh, run a prediction step uh, so actually if you do the if you have a validation step uh, at the end of each epoch, you would call dot evaluate. Uh, and for prediction, if you want to get the actual predicted labels rather than just uh, the metrics like accuracy and loss, you would call dot predict. Um, so this is all nice and simple uh, until you want to do something custom. Uh, when, to, when you want to do something something custom, it's very nice to have access to actual training for loop. And um, that's why, actually, in PyTorch, we don't have estimators, or at least not yet. And we have to write our own training and testing loops. So here is the training loop. Uh, for convenience, uh, we put it in the function. Um, uh, so here, uh, this term, uh, basically, it's the permutation, which is uh, something that we're going to be using for the exercise to scramble the pixels. Uh, by default, it's um, a range, so it does no permutation. Um, so here, um, as you can see, so steps as follows. We uh, zero the grad, uh, the grad, so basically as we run the training steps, um, for uh, we, we're going to accumulate uh, the gradients for uh, each weight, and we have to uh, zero those gradients uh, before the next uh, optimizer step. Uh, otherwise, it, it will uh, calculate incorrect values. 
so then we uh, get the output of the model, which is the essentially out, uh, what the forward pass gives us. Uh, and here, uh, we can define the loss um, outside of the training loop, but uh, this is just fine. Uh, for this exercise, we use the negative log likelihood uh, loss and give it uh, the um, target and the uh, output values of the forward pass. And uh, so we have uh, that, and we call the, uh, the back backward pass on the loss and complete our optimizer step, which is just a wait update. Uh, once we have uh, completed the uh, backward pass, we got the, uh, the gradients. And uh, in the optimizer dot step, we essentially apply the gradients uh, to the weights to get the uh, uh, new weights. All right. Questions? So you apply the gradient, a negative of the gradient, with some sort of an epsilon factor on the current weights to get the new weight. So it's yeah, in the, si uh, in the simplest case, uh, yeah, in the simplest case of the stochastic gradient uh, descent, we would just have uh, the, the weights and the iteration i plus 1 equal to the uh, weights uh, at i minus lambda, uh, the weight update. Right. right, so if you use some um, moment, uh, great, uh, SGD with momentum, there would be something else. Or uh, optimizers like Adam, they adjust the learning rate uh, depending on the parameter uh, to uh, improve the convergence. Uh, but in the simplest case, that, that basically weight update is what happens here at the optimizer dot step. Uh, there was a question over there. Uh, what does the term do? <laughs> Sorry, once again. The perm? Nothing. Permutation. But in this case, it's nothing. <laughs> because uh, by default, it's uh, identical range, so, which means we keep the pixels in the same order as they come. This is actually for our second exercise, where we have random permutation. I, I will show the pictures, so there is, no, uh, there is not going to be any magic involved. And I will show the pictures. OK. So, uh, the test. The test is essentially the same. Uh, one thing that will differ in the training and test uh, steps is that we won't have back, backward pass, right? So, uh, in fact, uh, you, can talk, you can do model.eval. Uh, here, this would set uh, no gradient required. Um, Alfredo skipped the order differentiation lecture yesterday, but um, basically, yeah, we can um, switch off the gradient from the variables. And yeah, so here again, we uh, do the for loop over uh, testing data. We do the forward pass, we calculate the loss, and we accumulate it. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we have the softmax output activation. So uh, in NumPy, that would look like uh, you would do np.argmax over the output of the softmax, right? So you want to pick up the index of the vector, which corresponds to, to maximum probability. And then we uh, count the correct predictions. We have the correct values. Uh, which is basically the uh, the handwritten digits, uh, handwritten digit one two three four five six, and pred dot eq. Uh, you, we can uh, substitute it uh, with just an equality sign. I will show how to do that um, later. Uh, so this stuff is just to get it back from the tensor to the actual scalar floating point scalar. Uh, so that will look a little bit ugly and. Um, but we have to get used to that <coughs> now. All right, I, I'm gonna hit shift enter. And uh, so finally, before we go uh, uh, and train the fully, uh, small fully connected uh, network, we uh, have to also, uh, so here we just already, we defined FC2 layer. Um, we call its constructor with the input size, number of hidden layers and output size, uh, hidden units, sorry. The number of hidden layers is fixed, of course. Uh, and we define the optimizer as the simplest, uh, stochastic gradient descent, SGD. We pass the model parameters to it and uh, define the learning rate and the momentum. 
Um, and that's all. Uh, we make sure that uh, we take a note of the number of parameters to compare it to what we are going to use in the convolutional. And then we just train. Oops, and I'm running out of time. I don't know how it happened. Maybe after, after the break. Oh, okay, so this is a time before the break. <laughs> I was like, that was too right. fast. All right, so it's running. Um, we see uh, here the, the, the values logged at the output is the number of samples uh, processed so far, and we also take note of the training loss. Uh, as long as the training loss reduces, we know we're doing okay. And I was expecting it to be faster, but hey. <laughs> So, a nice check to do is actually to check this first number. You always have to check what this number is. Uh, can you do the uh, E, the Nepper number, to, to this one? Yeah. Can someone can someone use a calculator to compute this? E to the this guy. Ah, uh, you tell me. Okay, eleven, right? So basically, uh, what you expect this first number to be is going to be the natural logarithm of the number of classes you're training on. Okay. So if this number is anything. Uh, away from the logar uh, natural logarithm of 10, then you must be kind of worried and something is going to be is kind of uh, screwed up, okay? And this is due to the fact that we are using um, the logarithm, did you remember, right, from yesterday? We were checking the log of the correct class and given that at the beginning all the classes have equal probability, given that the network is not yet trained, you expect to have one-tenth and therefore, log uh, natural log of one tenth, or is the same of minus log of ten. So minus log of one tenth is the same as log as of ten. And so this first number should be matching that one. If it doesn't, you should be kind of uh, worried. Okay. And we're yeah. So the training for a fully connected uh, network finished. We got ninety six percent training accuracy and eighty six percent tests uh, accuracy. Uh, before we go, let, let's just start the training for ConvNet and go to the coffee break. Uh, so here, uh, basically, uh, we just have to do the same steps. We have to uh, construct the model using the uh, class we already defined above, and we're going to use the same optimizer with the same learning rate and the momentum. Uh, the number of features here is adjusted, again, to guarantee that we have similar number of training, trainable parameters. See, number of parameters is 6422 uh, here, and in the previous case it was 6442, which is almost exactly the same. And one more thing. So here we have mentioned there is uh, number six of uh, features. So we are going to have, just to keep in mind the numbers, we are have, we having six kernels, which are uh, one times five times Five. So we have a collection of six, one times five times five for the first convolutional layer. So this is conv one. Then we have conv, conv two, which was, how much is going to be? Still six, right? So it's going to be six kernels. And this one was going from one, from one to six, right? So this one is going to be 6 times 5 times 5. So 6 because it has to match uh, this dimensionality here. And 1 because it has, it, has to it has to match the input dimensionality. OK? Yeah. So uh, so what, uh, so uh, uh, do these 6, uh, let's say for con 1, do these 6 kernels move together, uh, like scan together in the uh, on the picture? So they are going to be, uh, you have the initial picture here. And you have this guy here. And this guy moves across this direction and this direction. And it gives you the first feature map here. 
Then you have the second kernel. So you're going to have the second guy. Then you have the, how many? Six. So you have up to the sixth guy here. So you go from one, that is the input, my x, to my first h1 here. And then you're going to be using these kernels here in order to convolve this guy for the second one. Uh, but uh, just one yeah. question. But uh, is there any constraint that uh, prevents these six uh, like layers or two layers of those six kernels to be different for, from each other? In other words, does it uh, prevent uh, the six kernel to not look for the same feature? Is there any constraint? The constraint is automatically induced by the loss function. Whenever you have a kernel which is finding a specific feature, the other one will try to find other features. Because I said before, so as soon as you have one feature, uh, one kernel resonating with one specific kind of feature, that is going to be strengthening its own response to that particular feature. But that can happen to the second kernel as well, like responding to the same feature. Right, so if two kernels are initialized the same way, they may uh, learn the same stuff. At the beginning, we have random initialization. So basically, you're going to have, it's very likely that each feature, each kernel is going to be resonating with different kind of features, and then therefore is going to be optimizing for a specific target. So if there are no other questions, I think we can take a small break, get a coffee, try to run some more of the uh, exercises like if on your machine if you didn't manage to follow up. And we come back here at, I don't know. Right, so 3.30, okay? So just before we go to the break, so uh, convolutional neural network finished training. As you can see, we got 96% accuracy on the training set and 94% uh, on the test set, which is uh, out of sample. And as a result, we can say that the convolutional neural network performed uh, significantly better on this uh, type of task. And uh, let's see... Uh, how, how well does it do if you're trying to uh, basically remove uh, the locality uh, fr from um, our assumptions? And uh, let's continue after the break. Yeah. No, no, no. Actually, we, I, I, no need. I, I, I will say something else right after the break. I actually I figured why I didn't run faster because I didn't know.